Mm -hmm. Oh, it works. Mm -hmm. So, do you have something to say for the <laughs> two minute warm up? You need to warm up the crowd. <laughs> yeah. Um, I should maybe <laughs> I should maybe focus on what's happening here because it's oh, okay. obviously, yeah. So we are live. Okay. Yeah. What is the clock? One minute. Yeah. Oh, four likes already. Ooh. <laughs> so now we give it ten seconds or something. Mm -hmm. We can wait one one minute over. Okay, or we can just start. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so everyone, I hope you're ready. Uh, just a brief uh, for the ones of you that don't know, the Pint of Science is an annual festival that aims to deliver um, talks to a general audience and letting researchers interact with a general audience and also allowing you to talk to researchers to find out more what's going on, what's being looked at and so on. Uh, normally we would be in a bar, um, but uh, that, that didn't happen this year and not last year either. Uh, Pint of Science started in 2012 and it's grown enormously since. In 2019, which is the last in-person Pint of Science Festival, there was uh, in bars in over 400 cities across 24 countries. Uh, Tromsø chapter have yet to have a physical one, but next year, we hope. And you can now see the four people in the organizing committee here in Tromsø. It's me, Christoffer. Uh, me, Linda. <laughs> she is today's moderator and will uh, monitor the chat. I'll come back to that. <laughs> and we have our technical advisor today, Fiori, <laughs> up there, and our city organizer, Jaume, <laughs> down there. Uh, today's topic is being healthy up north, and we have three different researchers who will hopefully give us some really interesting uh, lectures or not lectures, but presentations. And don't be afraid to spam your questions in the chat. Linda will monitor it. And after all three have spoken, we will um, pick the best questions or some of the questions, I'll say, and we'll let them answer those. Uh, first of all is then uh, Laila Hopstock, who will start now. Bye. Cheers. <laughs> Thank you. I hope you hear me well. Uh, so thank you to the uh, Pint of Science uh, Festival for letting me present the uh, Tromsø study. So Tromsø, it's a university city up north with a population of 77,000 inhabitants living in an Arctic urban environment in northern Norway. The Tromsø study is an ongoing population health study in the Tromsø municipality. The Tromsø study has monitored the population health over time. And today I will present some key findings and research highlights from the Tromsø study from past to present from the 1970s and up to today. So, oops, sorry. I'll start again. So, Living up north, that can be quite tough. 
Um, so just give me a moment. Just give me like one minute and I'll find the slide again. So as I said, living up north can be quite tough, uh, not only because of the harsh climate and the constantly changing weather conditions, but the population health in the north of Norway has known to be worse than the health of the population in the south of Norway. And 50 years ago, northern Norway experienced an epidemic of cardiovascular disease. Young people suffered and died early of diseases like heart attack and stroke. At the same time, the city of Tromsø got its university and enthusiastic researchers and medical doctors wanted to study this phenomena. Why were cardiovascular diseases so common up north and why did so many people suffer and die from cardiovascular disease? So today we're facing the COVID-19 epidemic, but epidemics are not only communicable diseases caused by viruses or bacteria. We also have epidemics of non-communicable diseases, for example, cardiovascular disease. The most common cardiovascular diseases are heart attack and stroke. And cardiovascular diseases are related to many risk factors, both how you live your life and your family history of disease. That is both your lifestyle and genetics. But three major modifiable risk factors for cardiovascular disease are smoking, high blood pressure and high cholesterol. In the early 1970s, the city of Tromsø got its university and became a lively university city. And enthusiastic researchers and medical doctors, as I said, in Tromsø, decided to conduct what was later to be known as the first Tromsø study, to study the concurrent epidemic of cardiovascular disease. These researchers invited parts of the population to participate in a health screening. And they measured several risk factors, including smoking status, blood pressure, and blood cholesterol. And what they found was that the, this population was far from healthy and had a high risk of cardiovascular disease. Over time, the Tromsø study has grown bigger and consists today of several repeated health surveys inviting large parts of the population to extensive health examinations far beyond cardiovascular disease. Today, the Tromsø study is the oldest ongoing, most extensive and best visited population health study in Norway. And more than 45,000 women and men have participated at least once. And we like to think that we have measured almost everything. The blood, the urine, the teeth, the arteries, the eyes, the heart, the brain, even how we feel pain and much, much more. So the cardiovascular disease epidemic, how did that story end? What is the situation of Tromsø today? And I will show you some major, uh, some trends and some major risk factors from the start of the Tromsø study in the 1970s and today's situation. And uh, to keep it nice and simple, I will show you the trends for women and men aged 40 to 49 years. So let's start with the first um, important risk factors, smoking. In the 1970s, smoking was a very common habit. In 1979, nearly half of the population of women and men aged 40 to 49 years were smokers. So over the years, smoking has declined substantially in both women and men. You can see that in this figure. Today, a little more than 10% of the population is smoking. Smoking, as I said, is an important risk factor for cardiovascular disease. So when smoking decline, the risk of cardiovascular disease will also decline. Another important risk factor for cardiovascular disease is high blood pressure. In the 1970s, blood pressure was much higher than today. Over the years, the mean blood pressure, here shown as systolic blood pressure, has declined in both women and men. And when blood pressure decline, the risk of cardiovascular disease will also decline. Yet another important risk factor for cardiovascular disease is high blood pressure, uh, high blood cholesterol. In the 1970s, blood cholesterol was much higher than today. Actually, the mean levels of total cholesterol are much higher than we would consider healthy today. But over time, the mean blood cholesterol has declined. And when blood cholesterol decline, as with the other risk factors, the risk of cardiovascular disease will also decline. 
But unfortunately, not all is good. In Tromsø, as in most parts of the world, we get fatter. In the 1970s, the average woman and man were normal weight. But over time, the weight has increased substantially. You can see body mass index, or BMI, which has increased, and the average woman and man in Tromsø today have overweight. BMI is a measure of the relationship between your body weight and your body height. A normal weight here is defined as having a body mass index, or BMI, below 25 kilograms per meter squared. As more people get overweight, also more people develop obesity. And obesity is a body mass index of 30 or higher. In the 1970s, only 5% of women and men aged 40 to 49 years had obesity. But today, around 25% or one out of four of us have obesity, and that is a lot. Because obesity is only the tip of the iceberg, in the Trumps study, when we take overweight and obesity together, three out of four men aged 40 to 49 years are now overweight or obese. So you could say that if you're normal weight, you're special, it's not the other way around. Having obesity, uh, uh, is associated with worse health. Um, and obesity is a risk factor for, for many diseases, including cardiovascular disease. And obesity is a risk factor um, uh, both directly um, because of the obesity itself or via various risk factors. And obesity is not easy to treat. Therefore, preventing obesity is an important public health target. So what about the future? In Norway, life expectancy has increased over time. In the mid-1850s, women and men could expect to live much shorter than today. The mean life expectancy was around 50 years, much due to poverty and the harsh living conditions of the time. Since then, ex life expectancy has improved a lot due to both improved living conditions and advances in medical treatment. But as you can see, sudden events such as epidemics and wars, including the Spanish flu and the World War II, have contributed to periods of high mortality in the Norwegian population. In more recent years, the contribution of risk factors we've been through today, such as smoking and physical inactivity, has affected our life expectancy. And although we're currently more concerned about the spreading of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, the increase in obesity is one of the biggest threats to our population health today. So, to sum up, there's been a favorable decline in cardiovascular disease and cardiovascular risk factors, such as smoking, blood pressure, blood cholesterol over time. And the cardiovascular disease epidemic has ended. And today, the Trump's population is now on the national average concerning cardiovascular mortality. But as with the rest of the world, we're now concerned about the increase in obesity. And my colleague Maria will soon tell you more about that. As for the Tromsø study, we will continue to monitor the population health over time. And we plan to conduct the next survey of the Tromsø study in 2024. So if you're invited, we hope to see you then. Thank you for the attention. We have to clap for everyone. But, uh, <laughs> thank you so much for a very interesting talk. Uh, I like that your uh, drawing skills are on my level. So. <laughs> uh, next, uh, Maria Lundblad will talk about, as you said, more about the obesity epidemic and um, body composition, also based on the Tromsø study. So if she's ready, we can go over to her now. Good luck. Thank you. Yes, so first of all, thanks to Pint of Science for having me and for letting me present my research. My name is Marie Vasmet uh, and I'm a PhD student at the Department of Community Medicine here at UIT, the Arctic University of Norway. And I work with overweight and mainly visual fat. And visual fat is fat found inside our body and around our organs. And I will explain this uh, more thoroughly later. So overweight and obesity has increased around the world. And since 1975, 
the number of people with overweight and obesity has nearly tripled. And last year, almost 2 billion adults were overweight. And this is also the case for Norwegians, where currently normal weight, as Laila told, is no longer normal, but the majority of us are overweight. And this applies to both women and men at all ages, and including children, who all have more overweight than we did before. So we are getting larger and larger all around the world in all countries, and no efforts have been successful in halting this trend or in solving the obesity epidemic. But why do we care about this? Well, we care about overweight and obesity because it affects our health and because it is linked to numerous diseases and especially to cardiovascular diseases such as heart disease and stroke and to other diseases such as diabetes. In 2015, more than 4 million deaths were caused by overweight or obesity. And more than two thirds of these deaths were due to cardiovascular disease or diabetes. Also, in addition to the challenges related to diseases, the economic consequences to the society caused by overweight and obesity are large. And in Norway alone, the costs for obesity related diseases are about 70 billion kroner per year. So we now know that we are getting fatter and we know that the consequences to health and society are high. But how do we measure overweight and obesity? Well, usually we use body mass index. And body mass index is calculated as weight divided by height squared. Thus, it is easy to use and it's easier to calculate. Also, categories for different levels of body mass index such as underweight, normal weight, overweight, and obesity exists. So it's also easy to use and it's easy to understand. But there is a problem with using body mass index. And that is that it does not distinguish between fat mass and muscle mass. So the core definition of overweight is excess fat mass that may impair health. Thus, there are obviously some challenges when using body mass index alone. Because we do not know whether the excess body mass actually contains fat. And therefore, the men in these pictures can have the same BMI. And therefore, according to BMI, they can have the same risk for disease. But we do have other measures to address overweight and obesity. And one of these other measures that are also frequently used are waist circumference. And waist circumference is also easy to measure with the measuring tape around the stomach wear area or the waist area. But although stomach fat or abdominal fat is known to be of a special concern for health, it again contains different types of fat. So abdominal fat or stomach fat consists of two types of fat tissues. And this is subcutaneous fat, and visceral fat. And because subcutaneous fat is found outside the abdominal muscles, and this is the most apparent or visual, uh, visible fat, and the fat that you can grab around your waist. And subcutaneous fat has its main role in storing fat and serving as protection for our muscles and bones. But visceral fat is located behind the abdominal muscles and around our organs. And because it is so closely placed around and linked to our organs, such as the liver, it has more effect on these organs and therefore more effect on our health. So in the Tromsø study, as presented by Laila, we have a lot of important information about the participants. We have information about gender, age, information about several types of diseases and risk factors for diseases. But what the Tromsø study also have is a very precise method for measuring both fat mass, muscle mass, and bone mass. And this measure or this machine is called the DEXA machine. And the DEXA machine scans the body with low radiation x-rays and gives a good measure of body fat, muscle mass, and bone mass. So that way we get information about both overall fat mass in the body, but also we get the information about fat mass in different areas of the body. 
such as stomach fat or abdominal fat. And even further from this, we get the information about subcutaneous fat and visceral fat. So on the slide here, you can see how the scans are performed on the top with a, a woman lying in the x-ray machine. And you can also see the output from these scans. And recently, we have published articles looking into visual fats, trying to explain how visual fat looks in the adults from Tromsø and whether visual fat is a better predictor for disease than the more commonly used measures such as body mass index and waist circumference. So to our results and what we have found during our studies. We found that visual fat was linked to high risk for disease. But compared to the other measures, such as body mass index and waist circumference, visual fat was not actually a much better predictor for disease. Therefore, in large studies, or including a large number of participants, body mass index and waist circumference seems to be good enough for examining or establishing a risk for disease. Further, we found that while women had more total or overall body fat than men, men had more visual fat than women. This could indicate that women and men store fat differently. And while women more frequently tend to store fat around the hip and thighs, men often has a larger storage uh, of fat in the abdominal or the stomach area. And this might have uh, consequences for health. We also observed that visual fat increased with increasing age. And this means that the older participants had more visual fat than the younger participants. However, the increase in visual fat over time was higher in the younger participants. And this means that the younger participants are gaining more weight over time than the older participants. And this higher increase in the younger adults is confirmed by other studies that also uses body mass index and waist circumference. And we find it especially worrisome because it can mean that we in the future might be even more severely overweight than we are at the moment. And further, the positive trends shown by Lila in risk factors such as hypertension and cholesterol might be halted or even reversed if we are unable to handle the increase in trends in overweight. So based on this, we have to conclude that the obesity epidemic remains a challenge for public health, but we do applaud the positive trends in cardiovascular disease and risk factors presented earlier. And we are very lucky to have participants in the Tromsø study that makes it possible for us to do this valuable research. But the Tromsø study includes only the adult participants. And when we talk about an unhealthy development in the younger participants, we talk about people aged 40 to 49 years. However, we also have the Fit Futures study in Tromsø. And this study follows teenagers and allows us to examine and maybe, hopefully, influence our future. Thank you. Somewhat strange thing to applaud for, but uh, <laughs> still, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I would like to, uh, like someone can see in the chat, you are encouraged to ask questions and feel free to do it all do it now because we will then collect them together with some other we have and then present them at the end so don't save it for the end then we might miss your question uh thank you again to maria and next up is then dina stenerson who will talk about the fit future study so if she's ready we can go to her yeah hi guys Hi, everyone. Uh, first, I have to say that Tromsø is a really special city in many aspects, but uh, as a researcher, it's special because we have two really large population-based studies. We have the Tromsø study that we heard of uh, from the adults, and we have the Fit Future study uh, that studies adolescents. Uh, 
And I'm going to present to you uh, the Fit Future study. And I'm also going to present to you a bit about my own research where I use data from the Fit Future study. And my name is Dino Stenson, and I'm a PhD student and a medical doctor uh, working at the University of Tromsø. So firstly, why Fit Futures? Um, well, we have seen that the Tromsø study uh, was originally used for finding risk factor for lifestyle related diseases. Uh, and Maria has told us a lot about uh, the trends in obesity, but lifestyle related diseases and obesity is not only a problem in the adult population, it's also a problem for adolescents. Uh, and adolescence is kind of a tradition, transitional period where uh, there are a lot of physical and psychological changes. Uh, and there are also a lot of lifestyle changes and lifestyle choices that you make. And many of the uh, lifestyle changes, they last throughout your life and is established in adolescence. So the goal was to find targets for early prevention of lifestyle related disease. Uh, and we also wanted to know uh, a bit about adolescence, uh, both lifestyle and health. Uh, Fit Futures is a study that is uh, um, comprised of three waves. Uh, we have uh, the Fit Futures 1, which was conducted in 2010 to 2011. And we invited all first year high school students with uh, an attendance of 93%, which is very good. And then we have the Fit Futures 2, uh, uh, where we invited the same population, the same cohort, uh, two years later when they're third year high school students. And we had an attendance of 77%. Uh, and now, uh, a couple of years later, we have uh, invited the same population again. Uh, but, but now they are 26 to 27 year olds uh, and we expect 60% um, attendance. And we also invite people that has moved from Tromsø uh, to other cities uh, and we refund some of their travel expenses so they can come uh, and we can do um, examinations uh, at the research center. So here are some uh, pretty old pictures uh, from when we did the study. Um, the first one in 2011. Uh, firstly, the participants uh, were at the research unit at the university hospital and we did blood samples, we did uh, clinical examination, height and weight, we did blood pressure. Uh, and then the participants uh, filled out a questionnaire uh, about uh, depression, psycho psychological health, uh, friends and family and diseases and so on. And then they had a full uh, dental appointment with x-rays. They had an activity monitor, which they wore for eight days after the visit, uh, so we could uh, investigate physical activity. They had lung function tests uh, and we tested for asthma. We also had full body scan to uh, measure bone density and we had a uh, test for pain, uh, both pressure, uh, warmth and cold. Uh, so for Fit Futures 3, which we will conduct uh, this year, uh, we have the same measurements uh, as we did before, but we also have some new topics, uh, which is more relevant to the young adults. So we have uh, reproductive health, we have male fertility, we have uh, childhood trauma and fatigue, uh, and so on. So today we have talked a lot about overweight. So I felt that I have to present uh, something about overweight. Uh, this is not my research, it's a colleague of mine. Uh, and it's from the Fit Futures 1 and 2. Uh, and we also have some data from uh, childhood records from doctor's office. So we can see the trends uh, from two to four years to 18 to 20 years. Uh, and for the girls, we see a larger proportion uh, of overweight and obesity in the two to four year olds, but the curve kind of flattens uh, when the girls get all older. But in the boys, we have a steeper curve. And uh, when we see the 18 to 20 year olds, we have uh, almost 30% that's overweight and obese. So this suggests that we need uh, really early prevention uh, of obesity and overweight. 
So a bit about my own research. Um, my research question is, does the pill increase your risk of infection? Uh, and I think uh, this question might uh, need some background uh, for you to understand it, why we ask this question. So I'm going to tell you a story about my friend, Carl. Uh, this is a story based on true events. Uh, and I, I have anonymized Carl a bit in the picture. Uh, he works in the Norwegian fish industry, and therefore he has the fish head. Uh, and he works very hard. So uh, he and his girlfriend decided that they wanted to go on vacation. Uh, and they wanted to go somewhere exotic, so they decided that they wanted to go to Gambia. And Gambia is a country in the west coast of Africa, as you can see in the picture. So when arriving in Gambia, uh, the weather was great, the sea was blue, everything was perfect. Uh, Carl is a very friendly guy, so he asks the local kids if you can play football with him. Uh, and they say, yeah, said yes. The match was quite friendly as for, at first, but the, the kids were quite competitive, so it became brutal. Uh, and Carl fell and injured his knee. He got a small wound, which he just cleaned and put a bandage on and didn't think any more of it. So when arriving back in Norway, uh, his knee looked like this. Uh, it was red, it was swollen, it had visible pus. He could barely move it, uh, and Carl thought this is clearly infected. So what's the first thing you do when you have a medical symptom or uh, think you have a disease? Well, you Google it. So Carl Googled infection Gambia, and he got a lot of results of what this infection could be. So clearly, Carl got very scared and he just laid in bed and waited for death. But his girlfriend uh, luckily took him to the doctor's office. The doctor did a bacterial swab, uh, but when arriving at the doctor's office, Carl was already getting worse. He was ha having a fever, he was shivering. Uh, so he got admitted to the hospital uh, where he got IV fluid. He, has to, he had to get antibiotics, but after a few days, he felt a lot better. So he asked, uh, he asked the doctor, uh, what kind of uh, rare tropical dangerous disease uh, did I get in Gambia? Uh, and the doctor said, well, uh, your uh, blood sample and your sample from your knee uh, show that you have staphylococci. And staphylococci is a quite common bacteria that lives on your skin and your mucosa. Um, um, what's probably happened is that you have infected yourself with the bacteria. The bacteria had just utilized the moment when uh, the skin was broken and entered the body and given you a bloodstream infection. Um, so this was not a rare Gambian tropical disease. It was uh, Carl's own bacteria that has uh, spread throughout his body. So. Carl is what we call a carrier of staphylococci. Um, and about 20 to 30 percent of the adult population are carriers of staphylococci. And the most common place to find them is uh, in the nasal mucosa. We have two very important risk factors for carriage, uh, and it's gender and age. Men are more likely to be carriers uh, compared to women. And Adolescents and children are more likely to be carriers compared to adults and elderly. So if you are a carrier, you have an increased risk of infecting yourself with the bacteria, but you also have an increased risk of infecting others and transmitting the bacteria. So it's really unfavorable to be a carrier. Uh, so we want to pre prevent this somehow. Um, so we know that um, the carriage differ between genders and we know it differs with age, but we can't do anything about age and we can't do anything about gender without being really invasive. So uh, what, what's the other thing that's different between men and women and what differs with age? Well, uh, reproductive hormones or sex steroids. Uh, but we can't change our sex steroids either 
but uh, we have half of our population, uh, the women population, are using drugs containing reproductive hormones hormonal contraceptives. So we wanted to check if there was any association with hormonal contraceptives and uh, the courage of the bacteria. So hormonal contraceptives, we have two kinds. Uh, they both uh, 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 includes progesterone. Uh, the combined contraceptives uh, also has estrogen uh, in them. So combined contraceptives, it's the pill, it's the vaginal ring, it's the vaginal pa uh, patch, it's the IUD. And the progesterone contraceptives are the injections, the contraceptive implant, and also tablets. And the combined contraceptives are the most common, commonly used. So we used the Fit Futures population of adolescents. Um, to conduct this study. We did nasal samples of uh, all participants and we asked them if they used any hormonal contraceptives. And we found that women using progesterone contraceptives actually has almost half the risk of being a carrier compared to non-users. And women using combined contraceptives have almost twice uh, the risk of being uh, a carrier. So. Does the pill increase the risk of infection? Uh, well, maybe. Uh, our results from the Fit Future study, uh, it seems that combination contraceptives increases your risk and the progesterone contraceptives lowers your risk. But we need further research uh, to find out if this is really the case. So this didn't help Carl much because he obviously didn't use hormonal contraceptives, but he still appreciates that we do research to uh, help people and to prevent people from getting serious infections. So thank you. Yay. Thank you. Uh, then we move over to the questions and answers or yeah, hopefully some good answers. Uh, <laughs> Face, uh, you still have some time if you have some burning questions, uh, but otherwise we will uh, start now and we might miss your question unless you are very fast. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so far we thought we'd just go by the order you presented. So we have some questions for Lila first. Yes, uh, I was wondering uh, what was uh, why was the health in the northern population uh, worse than uh, the south population? Um, and did weather uh, play a, a role? This is a question for you, Laila. <laughs> yeah, thank you for the question. Um, so if we're looking at um, the data we have from the Trumso study, and if we compare that with other studies from Norway at the same time, that has also been able to study trends in population health, um, a lot of the, the worst health in, in the north of Norway uh, compared to the southern or other parts of Norway can be explained what, with what I presented today. So that we had a very high uh, prevalence of smoking. Uh, we had high blood pressure and high cholesterol. And the, these major risk factors, these, these really cardinal risk factors for cardiovascular disease could explain a lot of the higher mortality in the north uh, like 40, 50 years ago. So um, we have studied um, the effect of weather. Actually, we have studied the effect of uh, both the, the extreme seasonal variation we have in Tromsø with, with uh, extreme variations in, in sunlight and um, with this uh, uh, midnight sun period and the uh, polar night uh, period. We also affected, studied the effect of, of various meteorological factors such as wind and snow and all these things. But we have found very little um, association with with uh, with heart infarctions uh, which we thought we would have because in the rest of the world actually um, seasonal variation is quite common in disease and especially in, in cardiovascular disease but also in, in all cause mortality but in Tromsø it's not like this and I think the reason why we're not um, affected uh, of the climate is that we we over a long time have had very high living standards with warm houses and we wear protective clothing so we're probably not as exposed to the weather as we think we are. 
So it's safe to live in Tromsø if you choose to live this, in Norway. Then. Uh, yeah, it's it's very safe to live in Norway, and I think uh, Tromsø is a great city to live in. It's it's safe, yes, definitely, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I was also wondering if there's anything else that is special about Tromsø because um, I mean Tromsø and its location. Uh, to become such a worldwide uh, and huge population study. So I think actually we like today to think that we're quite comparable to the rest of Norway. Um, of course, uh, living in Tromsø is, is great. It's greater than many other cities. Of course, we like to think that. But actually, we, we're quite close to the to the national average when it comes to to many things. So when it comes to health today, we are we are. Um, as, as we have as good health as the rest of Norway when it comes to, for example, uh, we can we can see that on, on national trends of, for example, cardiovascular disease, mortality, and so on. Um, of course, we don't know what the future brings. We know that the whole north of Norway has had worse health than compared to the south of Norway for a long time. And, um, well, we'll see. Um, I think we could say that we still have a little higher smoking prevalence in the total north compared to the total south. So we, we still have work to do up here. Why do you think that is, that people smoke um, more here in the north than in the southern part? I think um, earlier uh, this has been explained by a lot of things. Um, general, um, so I mean really earlier days, uh, longer before the Tromsø study, lower mm -hmm. education, uh, and yeah. uh, you know, di working in, in different kinds of, of uh, more manual labor, uh, and, and so on. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, we might come back to you. We'll see if uh, some more questions pop up. If not, we'll move over to Dina. No, Maria. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Hi. Uh, so then we can uh, start bringing you some questions and see if you can answer them as well as Lila did. Yeah. Let's try. <laughs> Yeah, so first of all, I was wondering, how can I participate in the Tromsø study? Oh, okay. Yeah, you have to be invited. So that's uh, that's a challenge for you to do something with. So uh, mm -hmm. so you will have an invitation. And uh, and the, they are, uh, <clears throat> the study participants are selected in some way. The last, in the seventh survey of the Tromsø study, all, per, all um, inhabitants in the municipality of Tromsø was invited over 40 years, 40 years and older. So there will be some some type uh, of selection. So you may, maybe you're not old enough yet. <laughs> <laughs> have to wait a bit. Yeah. <laughs> no, but you will have an invitation by mail. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I was also wondering, uh, because you stated that men often have a larger storage of fat, in the abdomen area compared to women. Hmm. And I was wondering if this also mean that uh, men are at higher risk for certain uh, health problems, such as diabetes too, for instance. Uh, and if you can say or elaborate uh, a little bit about the gender differences when it comes to this uh, specific. Um, well, from what I know, men is at high risk for cardiovascular disease uh, in particular. But um, this is not only because of obesity. But but Laila explained the risk factors before, and there are um, complex interplay between a lot of risk factors: uh, smoking, uh, hypertension, cholesterol, uh, and uh, several of them. But the um, the visual adipose tissue uh, will kind of affect these risk, risk factors in a way. So yes, it will mean that they will have a high risk if they have a larger um, storage of visual adipose tissue. And for diabetes, this is, um, I guess it's even more important because uh, it's closely, the fat is very closely located to um, the organs producing insulin. And this will be affected by a larger area of fat. So yes. Thank you. Uh, I actually uh, have a have a question. Then is it yeah. uh, you mentioned that uh, BMI might be a crude uh, measurement that's not always the best one? But is there any way of measuring fat and muscle at home 
in a better way than stepping on the weights? Well, I guess uh, at an individual level, common sense is uh, quite <laughs> important. <laughs> So that but, uh, standing in the mirror and squeezing works? That's well, you can do that. There, there, there exists a lot of tools to measure a body composition, of course, but uh, skin full calipers is something that you could use at home. And this is kind of this um, uh, calipers that you can uh, try to uh, measure uh, certain areas of your body. But I mean, there are also biomedians, those uh, things you can stand on, stand on at training centers and stuff that will also um, kind of give you a measure for uh, body composition. But I guess that looking out, look the, uh, looking yourself in the mirror and, uh, mm -hmm. and using some common sense and trying to um, yeah, stay as healthy as you can, that's, uh, that's good enough. Okay, so I have one more uh, question. Hmm. Uh, I was wondering uh, why is there an increase uh, in overweight among the youngest population? Uh, and is there anything we can do to prevent this negative trend uh, so we can you know, save the future? <laughs> yeah, wouldn't that be great if I could answer that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess that's, uh, that's, uh, that's a huge challenge and that's, um, my belief is that uh, the measures needs to be taken on a much larger scale. So on a large level, and like Dina says, you have to intervene early or um, and try to take on public health measures that maybe targets the younger generations, um, maybe especially those that uh, lack the means to attend physical activity or yeah i think there's a lot that could be done but i think it's um it's a lot this this will be a lot it's a large lot of work but i think oh, oh, it's definitely hope but i think it's um it's um an organizational question we need something bigger something uh, it's a public health measure that needs to be taken yeah yeah okay thank you thank you uh, Thank you. Then we will actually move over to our last speaker, Dina, and we have some questions for you as well. And then we'll, uh, yeah, you can start. Yes, so related to what uh, Maria just told us, uh, I was wondering if there is anything parents can do um, to influence uh, their children to, you, I mean, become more healthier, eat better, so we can reduce uh, obesity among the younger population? Well, um, really good question. Um, so I don't work with obesity, but I will answer as well as I can. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think parents have a big influence on children and what they eat. Um, children eat what parents eat until they are like, 15, 16, then they may have uh, packed their own lunch or eat with friends. So uh, the influence of parents are uh, is large. Uh, and uh, adolescents still eat most of their meals with their parents, and the parents probably make the meals for the adolescents. And also, uh, we know that uh, habits like diets, uh, they um, they are established in the adolescence period. So if parents have like a healthy, uh, healthy diet from early on, I think uh, it will stick with the children and with adolescents and in adult age. So I think it's a big influence what parents um, make for the children. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I have a question related to Another one we asked, so we know we are too young to be, uh, and we need to be invited to participate in the Tromsø <laughs> study. So my question is, are we too old and will, <laughs> and is it invite only to be a part of the Fit Future uh, study? Or how yeah, do it you is. Become, uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> You're both a bit old and uh, you need to be invited. And uh, what's special about Fit Futures is that we have uh, the same cohort that we follow over years. Mm -hmm. um, 
but we we hope that in the future is that we can do more studies like this and invite uh, others that we can follow over time hmm. and i have a another question so i'm not on the pill but what would happen if i uh, <laughs> decided to uh, <laughs> to become a user would, would, do you think, how would that infect my uh, chance of infection would it matter or not well um we haven't done any studies on it uh, <laughs> because we have uh we don't have the population that uses uh, the male population that uses hormones but um uh the way that hormonal contraceptives works they kind of alter your natural hormones so that you don't produce as many uh natural hormones as you uh are used to. Uh, but as a male, uh, you normally have lower levels of estrogen and progesterone and uh, higher levels of testosterone. Uh, so I think maybe that uh, you could have a kind of a high risk because you get the hormonal contraceptives and you're being a male. But well, it's very difficult <laughs> to answer. Yeah. <laughs> well, that was actually the last question we had, unless I check quickly, no? Uh, so then all of you can come back so we can give one more round of applause. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you so much for uh, coming and speaking with us. And for any of the ones watching, I just want to remind you that the videos will stay up for a short while not forever but for a short while so if you have someone you think should uh, learn more about um, topics we discussed today it is possible to send them and let them see the, the video as well or the stream and lastly uh thank you to the ones behind the camera today once again and also remember to tune in tomorrow it's the same time, but tomorrow we will talk about something quite differently. <laughs> we will talk about ancient DNA and uh, how that can help, help inform us of the past and future. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, and that's it. Then I think we can wave goodbye and <laughs> hopefully go offline. <laughs>